Thank you. My name is Tom Vellante. I am a fellow entrepreneur as well as an investor. And I've been there with the heart palpitations and the roller coaster days, the ups and downs that can happen within just simply a day or two, and the adrenaline rush. I've, I've, been, there, I've been there through it all. Uh, I founded a company called Yapstone in 1999. We are an uh, online payment technology company, and we focus primarily on marketplaces and sharing economy, as well as certain vertical markets like the property rental market. So we were one of the first to process apartment rents and vacation rental payments. That's how we got our start. And today, we're primarily a marketplace sharing economy company processing for companies like HomeAway and VRBO. Show you a little bit about us. Payments is enabling commerce. And the interesting thing about what we do is we're not just a set of APIs and letting our partners and customers just go off and figure it out themselves. No, no. We are there every step of the way to facilitate a transaction and to figure out different problems in their businesses and different flows to create solutions that make it easier for people to transact. So that was our first sizzle reel from 1999. No, just kidding. We had, we, had, we, had, we had nothing like that. Just to give you a sense of 1999, how many of you know what Y2K was? And, and everyone focused on Y2K. All right, that's really showing your age and my age. So Y2K was the, the big impending doom uh, when we reached December 31st, 1999, going into 2000. Everybody was focused on it. It was the impending death of uh, planes were going to drop out of the sky. The computational grid was going to be, was going to be completely set to a halt. Uh, just another, uh, other things, Amazon was only two years public. PayPal had only started one year in advance, uh, one year prior. FinTech wasn't even a word. And social media didn't exist. The iPhone was eight years away. So that's the environment that I started the company. We've won a number of awards. You know, we've grown very well over the years, but it's a slog. It takes a lot. Obviously, it takes a lot of time. You know, we've been on the Forbes, one of the next billion dollar companies. We've raised 120 million of equity and 60 million of debt. However, we really bootstrapped the company for the first 11 years, so we weren't awash in venture capital in the beginning. It was completely a little bit of friends and family in 99. Took us, I believe, five years to get to three million in revenue. This year we'll do around 350 million. But we believed in what we were doing the entire way, even though it took a lot longer than we thought it was going to. And this is really a, a telling quote. There really are no secrets to success. It's a result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. And one of the things that I learned early on in my, in my 20s was that I was not entitled to success at all. We might have come from good colleges and maybe great jobs coming out of college, but then we become entrepreneurs. We're all, we're all here as entrepreneurs and, and some VCs as well. Um, and there is, there's no entitlement. And uh, it's, there's, 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 really no, there's really no shortcut. Um, you know, there have been a lot of different uh, things that have happened to us. I've been, in, I've been in VC meetings where the VC on the other side was the first question out of his mouth was, why am I here? You're boring me. And just the yawns and the rolled eyes while I'm trying to, while I'm trying to give a presentation. Does, that, does anyone here have, a, have an example of somebody ki kicking them out of the room or, or, or just, a, just an example of, of your idea uh, being rejected? Right there, what, what was, uh, what's a good example? It just happened. It just happened. Right. Yeah, so the, the Airbnb guys, uh, Brian Chesky 
and his partner, uh, they had a smoothie with a prospective investor early on. And the investor said, I'll be right back. And they're still waiting for that guy to come back. <laughs> so we're going to get into a little entrepreneurial trivia. So which unicorn startup was rejected by prominent investors all over Silicon Valley before finding a break? Oh. So I'll give you another hint. These guys uh, design cereal boxes. Airbnb. There you go. So I'll tell the rest of the story. Airbnb. They, they designed cereal boxes at the D Democrat National Convention. I believe it was Obama O's and Captain McCain. And they designed these boxes. They sold $30,000 worth of these boxes. That was their only revenue at the time. They, uh, the, the, uh, Brian talked to his mom, and she said, are you in the cereal business or in the technology business? And he said, it looks like we're in the cereal business right now. <laughs> so really interesting times, very, very humble beginnings by some, of the, by some of the greatest companies. OK, which famous tech entrepreneurs give each day a specific theme? You are. Someone plant the questions. But <laughs> yeah, you're pretty good. Jack Dorsey is exactly right. So Jack, as the story goes, will dedicate certain days to marketing and certain days to business development, certain days to product. Now, we all know that might not seem like a reality, and it probably isn't for most of us, but thematically, it's a very, very interesting way to look at things. And you know, to have a purpose when you get up in the morning, try to focus as much as you can, but we can't obviously focus completely on one thing when all sorts of, all sorts of events are happening to, to take away our attention. But it's actually directionally a really interesting way to go. There's another, there's another uh, thing that I do that I, I read along the way, which is you know, getting up an hour earlier than I normally would to try to do what I set out to do in that hour before even looking at any emails. And a lot of times, emails are reactionary, right? It's what other people want you to do, and it takes you away from what you set out to do. So I've, I have found that to be a helpful tool in, in, trying to, in trying to set my priorities straight and getting some things done right away. Which famous billionaire originally made a program for comparing people's faces online? You can't answer. For completely people's faces, uh, comparing people's faces online and voting, which was better looking before, social, before turning to social media? Facebook, exactly. You believe that Zuckerberg actually started the company as face mash, which compared looks, and realized that really wasn't going to go a long way. That eventually turned into social media. He found a great partner in terms of how to monetize a great engaging product that he had, he had developed. So these are all really, really great examples of incredible companies that have come from humble beginnings. Um, one of the key things, and what I'd try to like to leave you with, is uh, some, some different ways, some different things that I've found are key aspects of building a billion dollar startup. One is standing the test of time. You know, how can you actually uh, build your company to last? I'm a big believer in not building a company to sell. I believe that you're, to build a truly successful company, your heart has to be in it. You have to be passionate about the product or service that you're developing. You know, if it's just money, the first block in the road will, will tend to get people to, to quit if it's just about money. The passion and the belief in the product or service is what's going to carry you through. Uber and Airbnb are transformational businesses. They effectively created the sharing economy. Who would have thought 10 or 15 years ago that you would get into a car or allow your children to get in a car with a total stranger? Or find an apartment or stay in an apartment or room with a complete stranger? They have completely unleashed the, the sharing economy. And ask yourself the billion dollar question, will my company be around in 20 years time? And again, it is, is really all about all about believing in what you're doing and, and staying true to that. Another, another piece that I find critical in building a startup that's successful is innovating around market changes. So if you have any sort of traction, if you have any sort of success, you're obviously going to be around and you're going to see changes in the world. And you know, for us, we saw that things were moving to digital in terms of payments. And Yapstone decided to hone in on a, on a specific market, the rental market, where most payments are made through paper check. Even today, believe it or not, 75% of all transactions in, in the rental market are done by paper check. When we were starting, it was almost 100%. So we've made a little bit of progress in 17 years. There's, there's still plenty to do in that market. There's, it's, there's one thing to recognize that the world's changing, and there's a completely different, a different set of discipline to understand 
how am I going to actually monetize, monetize that change? And for us, it was developing a product that was not just a Me Too product. For, for rental managers, apartment owners, we had to provide a product that did not just treat them the same way that a, that a restaurant gets treated in terms of reporting and who paid and what they paid for and blocking, blocking payments for uh, apartments that are in uh, foreclosure or in, in delinquent rent. And so we basically built a very, very specialized product for this particular industry and honed in and really focused and stayed, and stayed focused on that. And another thing, the, the business keeps on changing. Your businesses are gonna change. But by 2019, 55% of all online transactions are gonna be made using alternative payment methods. So we had to quickly adapt to Apple Pay and, and Google Pay and e-wallets and alternative payment methods in, in Europe and other places in the world. Credit card, Visa MasterCard is not the only game in town and in, in, in the rest of the world. If you have a marketplace and you're trying to sell into Germany, 80% of Germans don't have Visa, Visa or MasterCard. They're using Sofort, which is a bank transfer product in Germany. So the world's constantly evolving and you know, it's, it's our job to be on top of it and be ahead of our customers in terms of telling them where to be. Do I have an innovation strategy built into my process? Um, this obviously is a, is, is a key to you know, any, any type of business. It's, everything is going to change. Um, let me go back one slide. Um, Kodak, for example, uh, ruled the photography market for 100 years. They had 80% market share. And where are they today? They went bankrupt seven years ago. They are still around. They're making some money off, of, a little bit of money off of their IP. But they're in every, every possible position of advantage to take, to take advantage of, of what happened in the digital market. In fact, they're the ones that even invented it. They're the first prototype in 1975 to, to come up with a digital camera. And internally, they said, well, that's going to hurt our photographic business. Let's bury it. And it was a perfect opportunity for them. Um, what, we, what we have found is you know, we, we had to pivot you know, pivot several times, uh, as probably you have as well. And so to do, be innovative is, is obviously, obviously key. Um, think small to think big. This is probably one of the hardest things for us to do in the room as entrepreneurs. You know, we want to disrupt very, very large industries. We want to change the world. We, 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 we want to make a difference. But if you look at the Inc. 5000, most companies are companies that are answering and trying to solve a problem for a specific set of customers, a niche set of customers. And so one of the things that we had to do were all the shiny objects that were presented to us in terms of the payment market. The first seven years, all we did was focus on multifamily and the, the apartment market. Everything that was going on around us, it wasn't as sexy as some of the things that were happening, but that was the right decision, really understanding what our product needed, what the industry needed, getting to know our customers in the industry, going to every single trade show, talking to customers, and really that, that notion around thinking, thinking small to think big. And it, it goes down, it goes back to you know, something that is, is key as a leader is to keep things simple. And in the beginning, the idea is pretty simple. You know, you know, there's, a, you know there's a product, you know there's a need out there in the market, and you have a solution of how you're gonna solve that product. But then as you get bigger, a lot of things take over. You have, you're hiring people, so you're spending time recruiting. You're out, you're out looking for money. That takes a lot of time. And you find yourself getting away sometimes from what is actually, what does the customer need? What does this product need to, or service need to do to make their lives better, which is really, at the end of the day, what they care about. So Steve Jobs, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. This was the first, this was the title of their first marketing brochure in 1977. So just remember, try to make the complex simple and help your teams cut through the noise and, and lead them through a clear solution. The Pareto principle basically says that, that 80% of what we can achieve is derived from 20% of our efforts. And so to the extent that we can focus ourselves and our team in, in that direction will make us much more efficient as leaders. So ask yourself in one sentence, what specific problem am I solving? Who am I solving it for and how? So collaborating with your customers. This goes back to what I was saying about as, a, as an entrepreneur and leader, how we can get distracted and pulled in so many different directions and perhaps lose sight of the most important thing, 
which is serving our customers. And collaborating with your customers is essential. And you know, a lot of times we tend to, or I tend to drink the, your own Kool-Aid, right? And you have meetings upon meetings and you're all talking amongst yourself where really a lot of the answers lie at, in your customers. And your customers are only gonna tell you things or prospective customers if you develop a relationship with them. And it goes much further than taking them to Laker games and big dinners. I mean, that's, that's important, but it's still, it's a little bit something of the past in terms of customers really want to know how you can help them, that you deeply care about their product and your product and, and making their experience better and easier. That's really, that's really where the collaboration comes from. And you're gonna decrease your chances of getting a call in the middle of the night or a letter, a cancellation letter, if you have a true relationship with your customer. So we have a great relationship with HomeAway. We have people embedded inside of HomeAway that have desks there. We establish our office across the street from them, uh, an office across the street from them in Austin. And I know what their pain points are at all times. And I know I'm constantly asking, how can we help you? What can we do? And staying close to your customer and a true collaboration is essential. You don't want to be just a vendor. You want to be a partner to your, to your, to your customers. According to research, 73% of customers point to customer experience as an important factor in their purchasing decisions. Thank you, Captain Obvious, and pay $5 million for, uh, for this consulting, but, but it's, actually, it's actually true. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll drive my teams, my product teams, to say, when's the last time you were on our product and used, your pro used our product as a customer? When's the last time you used our customer's product as a customer? And I own a vacation home. We have a big customer in HomeAway VRBO. I am a power user of HomeAway VRBO, Airbnb, luxury retreats. I really understand, and it's, it's essential you understand how it works. It's amazing how often people will go to their team and say, well, when, when's the last time you, you went through the checkout process? Or when's the last time that you called our IVR automated response and you know, found, found something, you know, just went through that flow? It's basic, it's simple, but it really, is, it really, gets, it really gets down to the, to the, to the easy. Um, how will I go above and beyond to collaborate with my customers? Um, just ask, ask yourself that question, what, what can you do in that regard? Number five is, is tying the use of capital to attainable revenue. When you start, you do everything you can to conserve capital, you know, similar to what, uh, what the Airbnb folks did uh, on, the serial, on the serial example. You know, we actually started in the, in the, the dot bomb era where all the dot com, a lot of the dot coms went under and we couldn't get any financing anywhere. And so one of the things that was around was space and so we rented a bunch of space and then sublet it. And we're making actually, our rental, our rental line item was actually an income item and we're making more money doing that than we were, than we were on, on our payment business. You do whatever you can. But when you raise capital, you're a steward of that capital and you have to treat it as if your own. It's, it's easy for people to start going off and spending money uh, when you're awash in capital. And one of the things I do uh, we have $85 million of operating expenses a year. I still go through with my team, line item by line item, to understand everything that we're doing and does it tie into revenue. And even, ta even, even expenses around, you know, we, we established a foundation and we give people pay time off to go off and do uh, something, something good for, for society and volunteer work. But that does tie back to revenue, right? Because people want to be engaged in companies that have social impact, it's the right thing to do, and you attract good employees, they treat your customers better, it all ties together. So even, some might say, well, it's not directly involved in driving revenue, I, I, I believe that it is. And the last item is evolve. And we're in an era now of AI and big data, and there are all sorts of ways to gather data in terms of where do you go? What do you do? Where's the, where's the world going? Uh, Dara, the CEO of, uh, currently the CEO of uh, Uber, and prior to that, the CEO of, of Expedia, would always ask his team when they came up with an idea, you know, 
do you have an innovative idea? Do you have data to support that? Which is an amazing question. I ask the same question. And one of the things that I also do when one of my executives comes to me with an innovative idea is ask them, is that a fact or a feeling? Not that one is, you know, one is independently not important. The, the key is to know which one it is. Are they, are, they, are they giving you that opinion and that advice to innovate based on data, or is it a feeling? And by the way, feelings are important too, right? And instincts, your own instincts, your team's instincts are extremely important. You know, sometimes there's no data to support where the world's going. There's no data to, to tell Steve Jobs that the iPhone was gonna be successful. The world didn't even know they needed an iPhone. So that's, that's, a key, that's a key element. And you can ask the question, how will I continue my education to stay competitive in my industry? So that is how I built a billion dollar company. <laughs> it's, it's easy. Uh, any, any, any questions? Damian Fuentes, former competitor. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how uh, regulatory agencies, MTLs, OFAC, uh, Vantive, uh, First Data have, has affected your ability to innovate and to change along the way and the, the way that it's actually morphed your company? Yeah. So you're going to have to face, as you get bigger and bigger, you're going to be in the crosshairs. And the more you're trying to disrupt, the, the more headwinds you're going to face. And, you know, Airbnb saw it, Uber saw it. They're disrupting massive industries. The, the taxi industry and the hotel industry were not about to, you know, not, not about to lay down. Uh, oftentimes, you know, regulation doesn't even contemplate what you're doing. So the gut reaction of legislators is to say no. And what you were mentioning in your question around uh, MTLs, which are money transmitter licenses, uh, and things that allow you to move large amounts of money, uh, are very, very expensive uh, and, and very complex, and you have to get a team of people. I now have 40 people in legal and compliance to help us, to help us through that minefield. But how we view it is, at the end of the day, to, to have these things and invest in them because it creates a moat around your company. It's, it's hard to do. In, in some instances, it takes years to get fully compliant. With, with many of the laws, and it's just, gonna get, it's just going to get more strict with the Facebook data privacy issues. Uh, we're, we're, we're already seeing an impact on you know, increased regulation, and it's, it's just a fact of life. We're moving a lot of money, and we believe actually now it's a competitive advantage. We've won business based on our compliance, our disaster recovery, how we, how we secure our data. That's how we actually go in with, with a lot of these pitches and actually, and actually win business because of them. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Hassan Karim again from Stable Cyber. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us. All of the brilliant and motivational insight. Uh, my question is he's really- paid, He's paid, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> one day. Um, okay, my real question, and I see one minute, is really at the point of when do you decide to leave your job and go do it full time? Yeah, that's, 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 that, that, that's an amazing question. So you know, I was working for a private equity fund. It was 1997. They didn't want to do anything related to internet or technology. And I just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick myself if- I, um, 40 years, 30 years, I'm going to look back and say, why didn't, I, why didn't I switch? Why didn't I learn? And so I actually left and started angel investing and made a ton of mistakes. But one of the companies that I seed funded was Yapstone. And I fell in love with it. It, was a, it became a passion project. You know? And I started seeing some early wins. And that's what you want to see. It doesn't have to be home runs. But we just started you know, seeing month over month, month over month progress. And I really like the operational side of the, side of the business as well. And, and being an entrepreneur is, is highly creative. But that's a great, it's a great question. When, when, do you, when do you decide? And I think it's when you say there's no other option. I, I, I don't want to do any, I can't see doing anything else is, is really, is kind of that tipping point. Yeah. Since you have been doing the 
you know, financial service uh, for retail store for 19 years. How do you see their blockchain cryptocurrency going change or may not change or may just be a bubble? How do you think it can change your business and others as well? Yeah, so we're, we're doing a lot in the way of blockchain and studying how, how it's going to affect us. I, I, I absolutely think it's here to stay. I don't, uh, I, I don't necessarily prescribe to the 1,300 cryptocurrencies that are currently out there. Uh, there, there are going to be a few winners, um, but we're looking at it really more on, on, from the blockchain perspective of you know, keeping your data safe as well as, as, as moving, moving money more economically around the world and instantly. So in terms of foreign exchange and, and, uh, and just and the, um, the, how quickly you can, you can move, move money is, is really how we're looking at it. No, we have some Skunk Works things that are going on, but, uh, but stay tuned on that one. Yep. Great. So, is, so one of, I just want to leave with one thing. I, am I going over a little bit? No, please. please okay. Go ahead. Great. So, you know, it's been, it's, been a long, it's, been a, it's been a long journey. When I told some people in the back room I've been doing it since 1999, they were like, what? Um, and, you know, everybody in this room has the ability to build an extremely successful startup. And there are going to be lots of roadblocks. Some days it's going to seem like everything, the world is against you. And I've had, believe me, I've had those days. But, you know, stay true, stay passionate, make sure your heart's in it. And ask yourself, why not you? Why, why not you have this billion-dollar startup? Why not your company? I'll just leave with you with that. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you.